Lucius Apuleius Saturninus, Tribune 103 and 100 BCE. Saturninus was one of Rome's so-called demagogues, i.e. men who used the powers of the tribunate in order to pass popular legislation without the approval of the Senate. Of all of the so-called demagogues, none of them has received a worse rap than Saturninus. If we think about figures like the Gracchi, they had their defenders in antiquity and they have had their defenders in modern times. The same can be said of Saturninus's younger contemporary, Livius Drusus the Younger. However, Saturninus seems to have attracted no fanfare and has almost no defenders. In this video, what I'd like to do is challenge the sort of traditional narrative that Saturninus was just a simple thug and political opportunist. I would like to argue that while he certainly was thuggish in many ways and clearly had some deep flaws, he did have some political vision and he also had a little bit of statesmanship in him, even if it was in some fairly limited quantities. So let's take a look at Saturninus's life and career. We don't have any information on Saturninus's immediate relatives. It would be useful to know how well his father did in politics, but that information does not seem to be available. We do know that he hails from the Gens Apulea. This was a noble plebeian family whose rise to senatorial status seems to date back to at least the early fourth century meaning that while his family may not have been one of the original ruling families of Rome, they got in on the game relatively early. In 300, one of the members of the extended Apulea Gens, Quintus Apuleius Panza, was able to achieve the consulship. The branch to which Saturninus belonged, the Apulei Saturnini, seems to have emerged in the second century I think the first mention is around the year 168 or so, and this branch was less prominent than the other branches of the family. However, since it still belonged to a noble house, it was a good name to bear, and Apuleius Saturninus could expect to have a pretty distinguished career so long as his family kept up its fortune and he understood politics well enough to get along. We first encounter Saturninus in the pages of history in the year 104. That year, he was serving as Keister of Ostia. To become Keister, you needed to be around 30 years old. This was the first office that one held on the Cursus Honorum, so we're meeting Saturninus just as he's really getting into politics. He had a pretty good assignment as Keister. He was in charge of Ostia, Rome's port, where he would be in charge of the incoming grain shipments. This was an important task, and it was a good way to show that he was responsible. However, the downside to this would be that, as someone in Ostia, he would not necessarily be at the heart of the action in Rome, so it wouldn't garner him the attention perhaps he felt he deserved. That being said, not a bad assignment. However, the year 104 was not a great year to have this job. There was a grain shortage because Rome at this period was already dependent on foreign grain, but the place that they depended on was Sicily. And Sicily was in revolt. So the Senate, to respond to public pressure, decided to replace him with the princeps senatus Marcus Aemilius Scaurus. Supposedly, according to our sources, Saturninus took this as a personal affront developed a deep-seated hatred of Scaurus personally and the Senate more broadly, and became a popularis. I think that this narrative is complete and total horseshit. This seems like a complete smear against Saturninus, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense if we think it through. First of all, if we think about the situation in 104, it's clear that what the Senate was trying to do is bolster public morale and show the people that the Senate cared about the problem. We have to remember there were two major crises going on. In the north, a Roman army at Arausio had just been annihilated by Gauls. Due to the events of the early Republic, Romans still retained a healthy fear of the Gauls. So the public was panicked about that. After the events at Arausio in 105, the following year a slave revolt broke out on Sicily and that endangered the grain supply. 
So all at once, it looked like the world was crumbling. So um, the Senate took some fairly unorthodox actions during this period, the Senate and its tribunes, I should say. Um, one of those was to give Gaius Marius, the successful general against Jugurtha in Africa, another back-to-back -back consulship and send him north to deal with the Gallic threat. At the same time, they needed to do something at home. They already had armies going to Sicily to try to put down the revolt, but in the meantime, they needed to keep people fed. And by sending Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, what the Senate was doing was sending a signal that it cared and that they had the problem well in hand. This was not intended as a reproach against Saturninus, and I seriously doubt that he would have taken it that way. Quite likely, the ascription of this motive to him was nothing more than a smear written after he was dead in order to blacken his character and paint him as a worse and more petty person than he was. The idea that this so-called insult will be enough to drive him to adopt the mantle of a popularis also seems a bit far-fetched. Most likely, he would have been a popularis with or without this event having occurred. Saturninus, as I mentioned at the outset, served as tribune twice, once in 103 and again in 100. Unfortunately, our sources were not super forthcoming when it came to delineating what he did in his first term as opposed to the second term. And this means that the chronology of his legislation is difficult to establish. However, I have tried to guess as well as I can based on the larger context. I can't guarantee you that I got the chronology completely correct, but I did the best I could. I also think that it must have been the case that many of Saturninus's more controversial moves actually occurred during his first tribunate, since, as we'll see, after his time as tribune, his opponents worked tirelessly against him in both 102 and 101 to remove him from the Senate and then to prosecute him on some really bogus sounding charges. The careers of both Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus ended with violence from their fellow senators. The official line of the Senate is that the two men had been demagogues and they had been responsible for trying to overthrow the Senate or at least undermine its constitutional authority in some way. They were regarded more or less as class traitors and people who had undermined the institutions of the Republic. Saturninus, however, begged to differ and he wanted to take up the mantle of the Gracchi and legislate in the same way. He not only wanted to legislate in the same way, but he wanted to make sure that everyone knew exactly what he was doing, and he was not subtle about it. The reason for his lack of subtlety is obvious. The Gracchi still had some enduring popularity, even though it had been about 20 to 30 years since the Gracchi had operated, 20 years in the case of Gaius. So what he did was find someone named Lucius Aquitius. This is an individual who was a paid freedman, meaning he was a former slave, and um, Saturninus had actually hired this guy. Aquitius's job was to claim to be the son of Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. Now we know that most senators and elite males were more or less free to have their way with women of, low, of lower class standing. And when it comes to slaves, one thing that a lot of people don't get about slavery, whether it's ancient or more modern, is that any slave is potentially a sex slave. So Tiberius or any other of the ancients that you've ever read about very well may have fathered many, many bastard children with slave women. It is possible that Aquitius was the illegitimate son of Tiberius Gracchus. However, it seems like this was more or less a pure publicity stunt, and Saturninus just found a guy who vaguely resembled him, and they were running a con. To really get the message across that he was the chosen one and the chosen heir of the Gracchi, Saturninus was often accompanied by Aquitius, and in fact, he would have Aquitius by him when he was speaking to the people. Aquitius would not be allowed in the Senate, naturally enough. It turns out that the sister of the two Gracchi brothers, Sempronia, was still alive, and she denied that Aquitius was in any way legitimate. 
I assume this implies in some way that when senators would have bastard children with slaves, that they would often tell their siblings about the existence of these children and provide for them in some way. Because otherwise, why would they ask her if the dude is legitimate or not? How would she know? Anyway, that's just a supposition, but it doesn't matter. I think it's fairly clear that Aquidius was most likely a paid actor. One of the things that students of Roman history find most surprising is that for the most part, whenever there was a military defeat, the Romans blamed not bad generalship, but the men themselves for failing to be valorous enough. It was part of the oligarchic ideology that anyone who was able to rise to office would be capable of commanding, and in theory, everyone in the oligarchy, everyone in the ruling class, was equally able to command men. That is how they were able to have these annual magistracies and justify the constant rotation of office and sharing of power. However, Saturninus would decide to change that a little bit, or at least try to. And I think that his decision here is what ultimately soured the waters between him and the Senate. In 103, along with his colleague Gaius Norbanus, the two tribunes decided to attack the generals who had commanded during the catastrophe at Arausio in 105. Saturninus seems to have drawn the short straw. They had to prosecute each of the two generals separately. Saturninus successfully prosecuted Malleus Maximus. Malleus Maximus, if you'll recall, was the new man consul who had marched north with his army to join up with the proconsul and form a larger army to confront the Gauls. By all rights and norms, he as the consul should have been the commanding general. However, his colleague, Caipio the Elder, who was a proconsul, was outraged by the idea that he should have to take commands from a, near, a mere new man. So he refused to cooperate, and that played a big role in the Gallic victory since the Gauls were able to defeat them in depth one at a time. Had they concentrated their forces, their chances of victory would have been much greater. So Saturninus convicted Malleus Maximus, and the problem was that most of the senators felt that Malleus Maximus was completely innocent. He hadn't done anything wrong. He had tried to do his job as best he could, and he had failed largely due to the insubordination of someone else. Norbanus, however, also prosecuted one of the responsible parties, but he luckily was able to prosecute Caipio. However, this prosecution did not go without objection. Caipio apparently had some supporters, and they started a riot. During this riot, there was a scuffle, and none other than the princeps senatus, Marcus Aemilius Scaurus, got bloodied. Apparently, a rock hit him in the head and drew blood. Caipio was forced into exile, and he was officially levied a large fine, but it doesn't seem that he ever had to pay it. He lived the rest of his life in Asia Minor. Now, I can't emphasize enough how unusual it was for Rome to punish or blame generals for defeat, unless they were blaming them on the grounds they hadn't performed the religious rituals before battle correctly. So if they had not done sacrifice before battle, or if they had misread omens against the advice of one of their official, one of their subordinates, then in that case they might be eligible for prosecution. But simple defeat was one, the will of the gods, and two, the fault of the men. So this was extraordinarily unorthodox. That being said, it seems that most of the Senate was okay with what Norbanus had done. They may not have approved entirely, but they were not outraged. Norbanus would go on to have a successful career and become consul. So clearly what Saturninus did in going after Malleus Maximus was more disturbing to the Senate than what Norbanus had done by going after a guy who was very much guilty of insubordination. It's possible that the prosecution of Malleus Maximus was seen as a one-off thing, and that while senators did not approve, it was hardly something that would make Saturninus a complete pariah or a threat to the state as such. That being said, I think that if the prosecution of 
an innocent consul wasn't enough to put him in the doghouse, this next thing was. Saturninus passed his signature piece of legislation, I believe also in 103. This would be the Lex Apulea de Maestati. What this piece of legislation does is to establish a court which will try cases of maestas against the Roman people. Maestas is more or less treason in a very broad sense. There are many sub-varieties of this and many ways you can be charged with it. It essentially means violating the will of the people in Senate. The earlier charge that this seems to have replaced was called perduilio. The juries here were to be composed of equestrians, as was the case with the new court set up by Gaius Gracchus. Now, while Gaius Gracchus had had these courts judge provincial governors, which had been problematic since it was the equestrian businessmen who stood to gain from corrupt governors, in this case, that was not as problematic of a move from a policy perspective. After all, equestrians also were required to serve in Rome, and they would be just as affected negatively by bad generalship resulting in battlefield defeats. So they, their sort of bias and class interest would not be nearly as much of an obstacle to the pursuit of truth and justice as it would be when they're judging provincial governors. That being said, from a Senate perspective, this is once again over empowering the equestrians at the expense of the Senate. Not only that, but by empowering the equestrians more, he is show, Saturninus is showing signs of falling in the footsteps of Gaius Gracchus, who is trying to build an independent power base. So that's really where the alarm bells would be ringing. The object seems to have been to give Roman tribunes and equestrians an established instrument to punish failed commanders. It's also simply possible that there were many in Rome who, as I mentioned earlier, believed that Roman gentlemen should be exempt from being charged with incompetence. Maybe they thought that it would be inimical to their solidarity as an order if they could be prosecuted for being bad at what they felt they were born to do. Uh, it's Again, there are many reasons why a Roman senator could be outraged by this, even though this policy seems perfectly reasonable from a modern perspective. You would clearly want your generals to be competent, and you would want them to be punished for incompetence, otherwise they have no incentive to hone their craft. I think that in this, Saturninus was most likely inspired by an Athenian example. The Athenians would prosecute failed commanders for treason if it looked like their failure was inspired in some way by sympathy for the enemy. And other, the Athenians also, though, would accuse people who were too nice to other powers of being guilty of taking bribes, or people who didn't want to go to war or did want to go to war of being bribe takers. Athenian politics was wrought with that kind of thing. But in general, I believe that Saturninus most likely had been reading up on Athens and he had gotten this idea that way. And then he put a Roman twist on it by putting the equestrians in charge of the court rather than the demos or a specially selected group of judges. Anyway, so that is what I think Saturninus was trying to affect and also what I think, why I think the Senate was so adamantly opposed to it. As I mentioned earlier, in 104, Sicily entered into the Second Servile War. The war continued until the year 101. This means that most likely the price of grain in Rome was high for the entire period, since, as I mentioned, Sicily was one of Rome's primary sources of grain during that period. Saturninus, not unpredictably, since he was a tribune of the plebs and, in theory, pledged to defend the interest of the common person, pushed for an increase to the grain subsidy that Rome was already providing to the needy. The details of what he was trying to do are unclear, but the proposal may have been limited to simply restoring the full force of the Gracchi era provisions, which have been slowly eroding um, in subsequent years. Whatever he was trying to do exactly, this does seem to have evoked the same knee-jerk response from conservative senators that it always did, 
but there was actually someone out there who had a major axe to grind and who was gunning for Saturninus and anything that Saturninus might want to do. His name was Caipio the Younger. Caipio the Younger was serving as keister in 103, the same year that his father Caipio the Elder had been ejected from the Senate and sent into exile due to his bungling at Arausio two years earlier. Feeling furious at the men who had sent his father into exile and damaged his family name, Caipio the Younger was bent on revenge. So when he heard Saturninus's grain bill, he spoke against it, claiming that it was unaffordable and the treasury couldn't sustain the, the expense. As a keister, he was responsible for finance, and this, he thought, would help to shoot this bill down. This was enough to convince two of Saturninus's more conservative-leaning colleagues in the tribunate to try to veto the measure. However, Saturninus tried to override them through implied force. When that happened, Caipio the Younger decided to use actual force, and he and some of his supporters broke up the proceedings with violence. Later on, Caipio the Younger was tried for maestas minuta, and what this is is effectively a minor form of treason that is brought against someone who breaks up a public proceeding like a, an assembly using force and therefore violates the will of the people and their right to be heard. It was pretty rare, though, that other elites, whether they be equestrians or senators, were all that concerned with the rights of the people to vote and be heard, so he predictably survived that case. For most people who have only read a general overview of the course of the late Republic, they probably just think of Saturninus as that one guy who was an important political ally of Gaius Marius. However, it's not entirely clear exactly how Saturninus and Marius came to be allies. If I had to guess, however, it just seems to be the case that they found themselves with the same enemies and therefore made common cause. In the year 102, right after his tribunate had ended, um, Saturninus would find himself once again under fire from the Senate. This time they were going on the offensive against him and trying to remove him as a political threat. The two censors in 102 were Metallus Numidicus, who had been the man in charge of operations against Jugurtha before Marius had taken his command, and Numidicus's cousin, Capiarius. They had actually tried to omit the names of both Saturninus and the obscure Glaucia from the Senate. They tried to do it quietly, but word quickly spread. When it comes to Glaucia, he is someone who first appears in this connection and is then an ally of Saturninus and Marius for the rest of his career. Whether he had worked with Saturninus in the past or not, I don't know. Perhaps he managed to alienate and anger the Senate before that in some other capacity. At any rate, he was a little further along the Curse of Norum than Saturninus, but he seems to be broadly similar in many ways. For whatever reason, though, our sources are much more interested in Saturninus. To get back into the Senate list, Saturninus and Glaucia actually sparked a riot which nearly killed Metallus Numidicus. He was forced to take refuge, and then his cousin Capiarius um, managed to quell the riot by desisting from trying to boot the two men from the Senate, so they got restored to the Senate list. That same year, Saturninus canvassed on behalf of Marius in his bid to win a fourth consulship. It's not clear whether Saturninus was for Marius's next consulship before or after the attempt of the censors to knock him out of the Senate. In the year 101, someone tried to bring capital charges against Saturninus. His crime was insulting the envoys sent from Mithridates of Pontus. Now, Roman senators were notoriously arrogant toward the emissaries of foreign kings. In all likelihood, Saturninus was not the only person who had behaved arrogantly toward these ambassadors. However, his opponents just wanted to hit him with something. So this is clearly something that is trumped up. 
And had Cider Ninus been in the Senate's good graces, whatever he did would have either been ignored or maybe even applauded. Um, the Senate kind of enjoyed flexing its muscle against foreign dignitaries. Um, their idea of diplomacy was simply asserting their superiority. At any rate, though, Saturninus was not convicted, but he did sort of see the writing on the wall that he needed some way to defend himself. And I think that, more than anything else, drove him to run for a, another tribuneship and also to really cultivate Marius as a close ally. Saturninus seems to have entered the tribune race for 100 at the last minute. Supposedly, the only reason why he was able to secure a second tribunate was that one of his competitors was murdered. However, since he was someone with pretty good name recognition at this time, I kind of doubt that. The elections for tribune were not super competitive, and the implication, of course, is that Saturninus murdered someone to get the seat. Whether he did or not is conjecture at best. Glaucia, the ally of Marius and Saturninus, was also elected, and he achieved the praetorship. Marius, for his part, won the sixth consulship. It's also worth noting that since Marius, Glaucia, and Saturninus were allies, and Marius was wildly popular, if he appeared before the voters and said to vote for Saturninus, that would be enough by itself, no murder required. The problem with Marius as a political ally is that he was politically inept in the extreme. His military prowess did not extend to politics, and it was largely up to Saturninus to get things done legislatively. Marius's main objective was to get land to settle his veterans on. The men who had signed up for him were not the Roman farmers of old. They were men who hadn't had land, and they had been assigned arms, and then they had served for a period of time. They had defeated the greatest menace that Rome had faced in a long time in the form of the Gauls, and they were seen as saviors for Rome in many ways. However, the other senators were already deeply jealous of Marius' achievements. Not only was he a new man who had achieved the consulship, but he had achieved six consulships back to back. That was unprecedented. No one else in the history of Rome had ever done that. So what they feared is that Marius's authority was already too great and outstripped all of theirs put together, and therefore it unbalanced the Senate in a way that made them deeply uncomfortable. In order to try to diminish Marius's standing, they wanted to make sure that he couldn't reward his veterans properly, so they were going to engage in obstructionism in the Senate. This meant that Marius was forced to turn to Saturninus, who could go to the people directly. This is where Marius's soldiers could vote, and where Saturninus could do what he did best, passing laws through the assemblies. One thing that Roman politicians did not like was having a large number of recently discharged and unpaid veterans waiting to get their money or their land. These soldiers tended to be disruptive and they tended to make demands on the Senate, often including violence. For Saturninus, therefore, his first priority was to find land for Marius's recently discharged veterans. Marius does not seem to have played a very active part in the settlement or in trying to designate the place where they should be settled. This seems to have been all up to Saturninus. From all appearances, Marius delegated the entire thing to him. Saturninus passed a bill to provide 100 yugera, which is approximately 62 acres plots for each soldier in Africa. There were many men settled in Africa. The bill passed, but only after heavy resistance from the other tribunes, and Saturninus had to rely heavily on using Marius's veterans to intimidate the other tribunes into allowing the bill to pass. So Marius got his number one priority done, but he would have a lot of trouble doing much else. Saturninus, however, would keep going, and would try to enact more legislation that would boost his own standing. Saturninus's plan, put simply, was to establish colonies in recently conquered areas where there was available land. He wanted to place colonies in Sicily, Achaea, which is effectively the Roman province of Greece, Macedonia, Africa, which is basically modern Tunisia, 
and possibly also in Corsica, which was not very densely settled. These colonies, if they had been established, would have strengthened Rome's presence in some vulnerable areas and also helped to relieve population pressure and urban poverty. There was a group of 10 land commissioners who were appointed, and these men actually include someone named Gaius Julius Caesar, who was the father of the future dictator by that name. What Saturninus showed with this is that he does have some policy foresight. However, he also has not the best political instincts. A lot of the men who were going to be part of these colonies were not just Roman citizens, but Italian and Latin allies, men who usually did not gain much from Rome's wars. However, Saturninus seems to have understood that these men were becoming discontent with the way things were and that many of the veterans who hailed from non-citizen populations in Italy were becoming restive. So many of the colonies that he proposed would have been formed entirely of Latin and Italian allies. You might have thought that since many of the Roman plebs would have been beneficiaries, they wouldn't have minded seeing the men they had fought alongside of also get some rewards. But in fact, the response was entirely negative. When they found out that part of these new colonies would go to um, what they would you know, think of as inferior citizens or possibly even foreigners, they were deeply upset. So this caused him, to, Saturninus, to bleed heavy support from among the Roman plebs who before had been massive supporters of his. That, in many ways, was his fatal mistake. Had he not alienated the Roman plebs, it's possible that he would have continued his career longer. However, this would fatally weaken him at a time when the Senate is looking to get rid of him. Prior to 100, the great orator Marcus Antonius, the grandfather of Mark Antony, had embarked on an anti-piracy campaign. Marcus Antonius was not the greatest soldier and his campaign wasn't going super well. However, he thought that if the Romans would close all Roman and allied ports to pirates, that he would be able to narrow down where they were and hit them in their lairs. So he requested that Rome pass a piece of legislation closing all ports to pirates. It would appear that Saturninus tried to latch himself onto this legislation, whether he sponsored it or he simply added something to it. What follows is not exactly clear. It appears that Saturninus tried to kind of bundle this anti-piracy measure with his agrarian law for colonization by inserting a sanctio into the bill where all senators were required to take an oath to abide by his legislation or else face exile. Exactly how he pulled this off and linked these two things together is not clear, but it is clear that he somehow managed to do it and that this caused grave offense among the Roman senators. Every senator ultimately caved to his demands and took the oath of loyalty to the legislation, except for his old rival, Metellus Numidicus, who chose instead to go into exile. Relations between Saturninus and Glaucia on the one hand and Marius on the other started out warm but tended to drift over time. It's not entirely clear why this relationship fell apart. However, I do have some ideas. Marius's own lack of political ability and vision meant that he was overshadowed in the Senate and in the public by his allies. And Marius was someone who was very prone to jealousy. He didn't like being outshone, and it's hard to blame him based on how much spotlight he had enjoyed for the last several years running. To now be upstaged by some junior magistrates must have been infuriating. Other senators also were complaining to Marius about his allies, and as they began to detect that maybe he was becoming a little bit jealous of the attention that they were getting, they began to butter him up a bit, treating him more amicably. Marius didn't really care who he had to be in bed with. He just wanted to be respected and receive his, ju um, 
due rewards for all of the services he had provided. So over time, the other senators are slowly winning him over to their side. Marius fundamentally believed in law and order. The guy was a soldier, first and foremost, and he had come to view his allies as dangerous demagogues. He was not all that comfortable with the use of popular power, even though popular power was how he had gotten to where he was. Now that he was the, you know, the senior senator in terms of honors, he felt like it was incumbent upon him in some way to limit the abuse of the Office of Tribune. So I think this was kind of what Marius was thinking. And I also get the impression that because Marius was not the most easy person to get along with, that he may have butted heads with Saturninus and Glaucia at a few times over certain matters. So there may have been a personal element involved. At any rate, we know that the relationship had cooled significantly by the time that the year 100 was drawing to a close. It appears that there was also some difference between the three allies when it came to their future intentions. Both Saturninus and Glaucia were determined to continue in office the following year. Saturninus ran for and was elected to a third tribunate. This is despite his diminished popularity for having helped the Italian allies somewhat at the expense of Roman citizens. Glaucia is the one who really caused problems for the pair, however. He was not yet eligible for the consulship based on tradition. There was supposed to be a three-year gap between being praetor and consul. However, as I mentioned, this was tradition and not the law. The curse sonorum would not become ingrained in stone until the time of Sulla. So Glaucia decided, hey, I'm just going to run for the consulship. So he does it. When Glaucia's main rival, Gaius Memmius, dies in a riot, presumably in some way sparked by Glaucia and Saturninus, that was the last straw for Marius, who decided that the two men needed to go. He decided that they were more of a liability than an asset and that he would gain more in terms of political credence from getting rid of them than he would from retaining them as his allies. So ultimately, it was a bout of electoral violence that pushed Marius over the edge and made him side with the rest of the Senate in wanting to eliminate these two men. Following the murder, the Senate passed the Senatus Consultum Ultimum and then turned to Marius the Consul to secure the state by any means necessary. Marius, who was someone who was much better at action than at contemplation, resolved to do so. Most likely in his mind, he was about to win a distinction and prove his statesmanship once and for all. After all, he was betraying two of his allies in order to uphold the public good. Saturninus and Glaucia, for their part, knew they were in deep trouble. They knew their recent history when it came to the passage of the SCU. So they seized the Capitoline Hill. The Capitoline Hill is sacred ground, and even though they were outnumbered, they knew that their enemies wouldn't dare storm the Capitoline Hill, since that's where the Temple of Jupiter was. And if a battle were to break out, it's possible a fire could break out, and that would invalidate everyone there and more or less make them the victims. Marius, however, while he was not a good politician, was still a very intelligent general. He cut off their water supply. He knew that without water, they had no chance. They were compelled to surrender after a very short period of time. Marius was determined to save them from mob lynching. He wanted them to face a trial and to avoid shedding the blood of two sitting senators on his watch. So to avoid a mob lynching, Marius had the two men shut up in the Senate House. His thought is that the people who were opposed to them would not dare to storm the building to kill them. However, some of the opponents of Saturninus and Glaucia managed to climb on the roof of the Senate House peeled back some tiles and then threw them down at the two men and killed them. Whether these were just random citizens who were outraged at the two men for whatever reason, or whether these were, say, young aristocratic um, equestrians 
who had a lot of anger to express and they decided to take it out on these two guys is not entirely clear. The reason I suggest that is because in Athens it was very common for young uh, aristocratic men to go out and commit acts of political violence. The revolution of 411 in Athens, for instance, involved a lot of young equestrians going out and uh, doing violence against their opponents, murdering a few of them, and basically just seizing control by force. But anyway, we're talking about Rome, not Athens. So not only, therefore, did Saturninus manage to act like the Gracchi in a political sense, but he also managed to die like them at the hands of the Senatus Consultum Ultimum and the citizens who had taken it upon themselves to enforce it. Saturninus is not precisely obscure. His name comes up often in lists of important Roman politicians from this period. However, despite the fact that he has a lot more name recognition than many of the people who worked during the late Republic, I still think that he very well might be the most underrated of the Romans who were operating between 133 and 31 BCE. First of all, he was a kind of uncle to the Marian or late Republican legion. Marius, of course, was the father of this system, which would recruit men who didn't have property for a long period of time and then reward them with land of their own. This replaced the previous conscription system, which just took existing landowners and put them under arms. The problem with this system is that you have to find land for these men. Marius was highly successful and had many men beholden to him, but there were senators who were not completely on board with this new system, both as a way of conducting war, but also they didn't want to reward Marius personally. By securing land for these men through the assemblies, Saturninus set a precedent that would really establish the way that Rome's military would function for the rest of the Republic and during the early and middle empire. So in that sense, he is an important military reformer. He may not have been the originator of the idea, but he was vital to the execution of the original land settlement for this new military order. He's a complicated political actor. He's often just labeled as a demagogue, but we don't exactly have a complete picture of him or his motives. Our accounts are all extremely hostile. I would argue that he actually has some vision and even some statesmanship. However, he lacks finesse and what you might call political horse sense. Saturninus understood clearly, based on his actions in forming colonies for Latin allies, that the allies were becoming discontent. He understood that something like the social war was possible. He also seems to have understood that military leadership is important and that Rome will be more effective if it produces better generals. While his positions were not popular with his fellow elite contemporaries, he does clearly have something like a vision for the future, or at least he has a few ideas here and there that could make the world, at least from a Roman perspective, a slightly better place. We also see that in the traditional narrative, Saturninus is the guy causing problems, that he is responsible for the hostility between himself and the Senate. However, I hope that I've demonstrated that this was a two-way street. Saturninus may have poked the bear initially with his actions the first time he was tribune, say as grain law, the passage of the court to try generals and the conviction of the not guilty Malleus Maximus, but his opponents in the years between his tribuneships did a lot to make sure that he felt like he had no choice but to continue to oppose them. One thing that Christian Meyer once wrote has really stuck with me, and that is that many of the Roman aristocrats may have actually been incapable of seeing a difference between their own personal self-interest and the self-interest of the state, since in their minds, the Roman state was essentially the um, collective whole of the great families of Rome. Saturninus was an aristocrat. Marcus Aemilius uh, Scaurus was an aristocrat. Uh, 
Metalus Numidicus was an aristocrat. Most of the major players in this drama were people who had never doubted their place in the world and who saw themselves and their family members as synonymous with the state. They therefore would take any personal attacks as attacks on all that is good and all that is natural and right. So the aristocratic temper here would cause these sort of insults to keep escalating and there's plenty of blame to go around. Saturninus was certainly not innocent, but at the same time, he is not the sole cause for the enmity between himself and the Senate, not by a long shot. Saturninus's death also marks the end of Marius's political relevance. Marius was obscure for about 10 years after Saturninus's death. Not surprisingly, the Senate decided to simply ignore Marius after his political ally was gone, Marius, the rest of Marius's consulship was quiet, and then for about 10 years, he was almost an exile, really, just a self-imposed form. When the social war broke out, a much diminished Marius would emerge. He was not the man he had been, physically or intellectually, and he would then blunder his way into a civil war of Sola. Um, had he been guided by someone like a Saturninus, most likely he would have done a little better, and his career would have lasted a little longer, at least while he still had his faculties about him. I would say the main significance of Saturninus going forward, at least for the rest of the Republic, is that what he showed is that the Gracchi model of being a tribune would work without having a Gracchi at the helm. Livius Drusus and Publius Sulpicius Rufus were direct continuators of the kind of politics that Saturninus helped to reestablish. So while he was not the father of the Gracchi model, he was also the uncle of it. He showed that it could be done by other people. This, of course, would also not only enable his contemporaries like Livius Drusus, but also someone like Clodius. The career of a Clodius would be impossible without Saturninus proving what he proved. So anyway, I hope that I've convinced you that Saturninus is someone to not be discounted or taken lightly, and that he actually was one of the pivotal figures of the late Republic. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian.